Snipes. My name is Pat Snipes. I'm the founder of the Before Slavery Experience, and we are delighted to welcome Dr. Joy DeGru. Uh, but first, our uh, moderator, um, Ms. Modesta Campinda, is here, and she will tell you more about Dr. Joy, and then we'll get right into the questions uh, so that we um, have enough time because we've got lots of questions. <laughs> so uh, we welcome our, our moderator for today and our um, very dear um, part of our organization. She is our public relations um, liaison and, and she wears a lot of hats as most of us do in this organization. <laughs> <laughs> and that is Modesta Campinda. Welcome, Modesta. Yeah, thank you, Ms. Pat, for that kind introduction. So, Dr. DeGru, we're so honored to have you today. And as you all know, uh, those who are attending uh, about Dr. DeGru's um, reputation, she's a renowned clinical psychologist. She is a renowned teacher. She is a renowned educator. And she has done so much great work in trying to um, reconstruct our, our communities as Black people in the diaspora and um, all over the world, on the continent, in the United States, across the world, just to help our communities heal. She has spoken at a lot of conferences, including the Oprah Winfrey uh, Television Network, and her work has focused um, on on racism, on the history of racism, on the history of um, uh, Black people in the United States. Just um, try, just trying to come out of that. Um, mentality of uh, slavery and oppression and just trying to understand how can we move forward and heal and build our communities and understand ourselves, understand each other and understand and, and, and help Black people in the United States be understood all across the world. And this is in my own words and not any words that have been written in any bio, but this is in my own words, as a person who's based in Africa, as an African, and we really do appreciate that because Dr. J. Gru, thank you for sharing that body of knowledge with us. So what is really PTSS? For people who have not yet read your book, what is PTSS? And how does it show up in our present day cultures? And how does it affect black the black diaspora communities? Uh, you know, uh, first of all, I do have four degrees, three advanced degrees, but none of them taught me what my research. Was. <laughs> I just I just want to be very transparent. <laughs> um, it, it taught me some skills. I learned some skills, but it did not equip me with what I needed to engage in the work that I currently do within communities uh, of people from of African descent. And I think post-traumatic slave syndrome is what it sounds like. It's multi-generational trauma. Um, multi-generational trauma is not new. We've looked at it with uh, victims of natural disaster. We've looked at Holocaust. We've looked at Aboriginal folks in Australia. We looked, looked at, you know, First Nations uh, people, um, you know, literally. Um, so it was always odd to me that when people were so, oh, yeah, post-traumatic slave syndrome, I don't even understand how we could have not been looking at it. We're not talking about a moment. We're talking about 300 years. And then we're going to just gloss over it like it didn't happen. As though somehow, you know, we, we, we got free and everything was fine. And then all of a sudden we have George Floyd and the whole world wakes up. Well, here's the wake up call. Anti-blackness is, is global. It's global. And that comes from a fundamental dehumanization of, of blackness, of the African. That's where it comes from, that whole idea that somehow we are less different when in fact we are, we are the first, right? We are truly the first. And, and, it, and, and, and I think for me, what post-traumatic does 
It lays out a historical context so that we can understand what happened to George Floyd. Because you can't be confused about George Floyd if you know your history. If you know the history of dehumanization, if you know the history of the United States Constitution and the idea that the black man has no rights that a white man is bound to respect, if you understand uh, that uh, that policing came up from, from slave patrols, if you understand, you see what I'm saying? So what post-traumatic basically shows, it's a blueprint, it's a map that shows you how the history of this traumatization, oppression, um, anti-blackness, white supremacy, has impacted us, how we have not swallowed it, fall, fell apart and rolled over, but that we've been impacted by it economically, socially. We've been affected by it spiritually in terms of how we view ourselves. Even Africans who are taking this, this kind of, I mean, there are Africans bleaching their skin in 2021. So we, we can't be confused about the fact that we have in some, in some cases internalized this notion of inferiority. And, and so what, what post-traumatic does is it unpacks the reality of what brought us here and, and says, now with this knowledge, and I believe when people know better, they can do better, with this knowledge, let's change that trajectory. Let's not have our Black children in 2021 talking about good hair mm -hmm. and being light-skinned. Mm -hmm. Right. We, th this is the kind of thing where how it shows up. It shows up in even how we perceive ourselves. Met a, a young uh, a young man from Trinidad whose family said to him, this was I want to be real. Let's see. see. I'm going to say about within the last 10 years, for sure, said to him, we just need to admit that white people are, are smarter than us. Oh, what? Wow. Right. He said this devastated him. These were black people who bought that narrative in mm -hmm. Trinidad in contemporary times. And so, but I get that. I understand if everything you see and everything that is attributed to greatness, intelligence, moral, uh, you know, fiber, whatever it is you're looking at is white, including God himself is white or herself or itself, which is not relevant. But the point is that we begin to see how throughout the diaspora, we have, mm -hmm. we have taken on some of that pathology that's right. that, that we got to take a look at and examine. Mm -hmm. That's right. right. And, and I totally related to that because personally, I grew up a Catholic in a Catholic church. And I always saw the white Jesus on the cross. I always saw Holy Mary holding baby Jesus. They were all white in blue all purity so psychologically though i didn't understand when i was younger and i'm in africa oh what what we are praying to is holy mary and the image that's on the wall that when you turn your head at whether at the walls or in front of you you are seeing an image of holy mary who is white and the baby jesus who is white and a jesus on the cross as a Catholic, you know how um, imagery really is a you draw in in our religion and in our, our processes of worship. And I am looking at that, and it is only when I went to Spelman in the United States that I began to really unlearn what I had learned all my life. So I think that conversation is really, really important of associating everything pure, everything good, and everything virtuous to whiteness. But how did we, how did we get there? Well, I think, you know, how, how did we get there? There's, there's two pieces. I know there's a lot of questions, and that's why I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get to them, because I have, <laughs> have them written out. Um, first of all, post-traumatic slave syndrome is not a diagnosis. It is not mm -hmm. a diagnosis. Uh, mm -hmm. Because what the diagnose, the diagnostic community would love to do is what they, they to pathologize us. Oh, you all are all broken and sick right. and twisted. No, 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 no. You know, you break my leg and you complain that I limp. This is a mm -hmm. this is a this is a problem collectively of of anti blackness, a lack of of really holding people accountable for what they've done, right? So we have this kind of oppressive reality, historical context. We have an institutionalized 
uh, system that does not produce justice. So then we're going to look over here and go, why can't Johnny read? You know what I mean? It's like, come on, let's take mm -hmm. a look at the larger system that has perpetuated this. No, it's not a it's not a diagnosis. You can give somebody some medicine, put them in a room and speak to them softly twice a week and solve. No, mm -hmm. not that we don't. Some of us need to be in a room talking to a therapist twice a week with medication. I don't have any problem with that. But that's not right. what this is. While it has remnants of extraordinary injury to our psyches in one sense, we did not we did not bite down on that and and literally embrace that. We embraced the, the larger construct of who and what we are as a people, which is why we've been able to continue a trajectory. But we are also now seeing for the first time the world emerge because of what happened here in the United States and acknowledge all over the world. You got folks apologizing, taking down statues, trying to hand out checks because they don't want the covers to be pulled completely off. And we mm. see who is really accountable for all of this. And so, again, I take full responsibility for my behavior. I, I take full responsibility as every individual can. But you cannot, you know, what did Malcolm said? He said he could feel no compassion in him for a people, for a, a society that will crush people and then penalize them for not being able to stand up under the weight. Mm. So there are two processes that are going on. And no, this cannot be solved in a, in a, a, a clinic. Because in that way, let me tell you what that means. If people could, if people could, put, could literally make this a diagnosis, white people would go, oh, one more thing I could get paid for. Right. Yeah. That's right. That's, that's right. And that's the danger in that. That's yeah, the danger in that. And that's why we raised that question to say that if we are going to, to talk about it as a post traumatic slave syndrome, then somebody is going to pick it up as a problem that is really inherent and 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 that's and, and trying to make profit out of it that's because like someone, that's has. The someone already right. has um there's a group of folks and god bless them they even cite me uh they they have a, a concept called post-traumatic slave disorder slavery disorder i do not agree with them right. i don't believe that it's not a disorder which means that we are pathologized it means yeah. that your assault on us through 300 years has produced injury and your and your institutionalized oppression and white supremacy continues to oppress us that's the truth and that is the truth that again this whole idea of critical race theory that everybody's talking about critical race theory you know what my my, my niece calls it she calls it ttdt tell the damn truth <laughs> That's, that's what this is. We don't have to get right. philosophical. We don't need critical race theory. We just need the truth. Right. And that is what people are trying to avoid. The truth, mm -hmm. literally. Mm -hmm. Trying to shut it down in the country. It ain't going to happen, but they certainly are trying. <laughs> no, we, we, are, we are too woke. We are getting woke. And more, more people are asking, are starting to ask more questions. And it is, it is actually a phenomenon. Because more people across the world are beginning to question what they've learned all their lives. And they're beginning to ask questions. And they're beginning to have the courage and strength to speak out. Which is something that is rare in black communities across the globe. So let me explain what it means. So when I started to look at post, here's what we recognize. Let me explain trauma. Because you got to understand that I'm looking at trauma. The very first thing I started to look at, when someone says, Black says to another Black person, gosh, she was pretty, even though she was so dark. Okay. Mm. I, you know, those, are, those are the kind of things that, that as a clinician and as a social scientist, I wanted to understand the etiology of what's rotating in your head for you to say that, right? Is that pervasive? Does everyone feel that? Is it just people in, in America that feel it? Or is it the people in the Caribbean that feel it? Folks in Africa feel it? What is going on with that? And so what I chose, chose to do was to look at the etiology of that. Where do these behaviors come from? Which is what led me on a trail of American chattel slavery, right? Now, again, mm -hmm. slavery, not new. Africans enslaved folks in Africa. But mm -hmm. so did most people on the planet. They had some form of slavery or indentured servitude. When Europeans, yeah. however, began to enslave people of African descent, it became a business. Let's be clear. It created the backbone of an entire economy. It was about money. 
and it and it continues to be about money. And so mm -hmm. what we have to what we have to recognize about this is no, it's not that you have it. It's not a thing you have. It's not COVID, uh, right? right? It's looking at systemic generational trauma. And we're looking at how trauma shows up. So now let me unpack it so that you can, can wrap your head around it. So when a person is traumatized, let me give you an example. I usually use this example. If someone shoots you, one of you that are on camera right now, comes in the house, comes in a room and shoots you, you're traumatized, right? If you have a loved one nearby that saw it, they too are traumatized. Those of us that are on Zoom looking at you are traumatized. You have family somewhere that live in another part of the country, hear about it, don't see any of it, are traumatized. And yet someone literally sitting in the room may not be. Trauma is not something across the board that you can diagnose just because you have a traumatic event. Doesn't mean people are traumatized by it. Everybody has a differential response, right? But here's what we do know. Let's take a look at the person that is traumatized. Because they've been shot, beaten, raped, sold, whatever the case is, they're traumatized, right? That person, without help, okay, because when, when I say traumatized, I'm not talking about philosophical, I'm talking literally. A difficulty falling, staying asleep, feeling a foreshortened future, outbursts of anger. Uh, those are symptoms of PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, which a person might have. Now, when it comes, comes to people of African descent, I wasn't there. I wasn't there when any of this happened. But now let's look at how things get transmitted generationally. So now you have this traumatized person, originally traumatized, really traumatized, needing some help, both physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual, but didn't get it. They didn't get any help. For 300 years, we didn't get any help. When someone raped your eight-year-old or passed her around to the visitors that night or sold off your son or your husband or your, you know, nobody came in. Dr. Phil didn't show up. Right. So we didn't have any help with that, but we did have symptoms. We had, you know, exaggerated startle response, all of these different, you know, behaviors. But you're raising children. Yes, the children don't understand that this is broken behavior. They don't understand that this is trauma related behavior. So they do it, too. Mm -hmm. It's called social learning. You learn from the people in your environment. And if the people in your environment have adapted to survive hostile environments, you learn that adaptive behavior too. And you pass it along. Case in point, give, let me give you a real live one that I traced back to slavery, right? So, and I don't know how this is going to be interesting uh, that you might be able to tell me a little bit about what happens in, in your part of the world in Africa, but in the places yeah. I've visited. So let's just say, I'm going to give you an example. Mm -hmm. And you probably can see this online because I talk about it all the time. So you have uh, a black person and a white person, black mother, white mother, black father, white father. They have children, two sons. The sons know each other. They live here in the United States. They play together, go to school together. Black mother, white mother find themselves, you know, at a, at a meeting. Maybe it's a school meeting. They're seated next to each other because they know each other and their sons play together. Black mother seated next to the white mother, sons on either side of them. Black mother leans over to the white mother and says, oh my goodness, I've noticed your son is doing really well. White mother perks up and goes, thank you so much. It's so nice for you to say, you know, great, great. She leans back and stops and thinks about it and goes, wait a minute, her son's the one. She's excelling. Her son is excelling my son. This is what the white mother knows. So she leans forward <laughs> and says to the black mother, my son's coming. Your son is the one that's really coming along. Black mother mm -hmm. response. Think about it. Caribbean, African American. I mean, different folks. I, and again, certain parts of Africa, but I certainly don't know all of it. Says to the black mother, your son's really doing well. Her response, oh, girl, get out. That boy is such a knucklehead. Lord, he works my nerves. You just would never believe. Ooh, girl, get out of town. And the, <laughs> and the entire time that she's saying it, because there's a secret. We mm -hmm. all know the secret. And secrets make mm -hmm. us sick. That's my, my pronouncement as it relates to post-traumatic. When people know better, they do better. So now let's unpack that. Why is that mother denigrating her child after someone just complimented her? her? Why would you do that? And all of us know that even though the mother's saying, girl, get out of here, I want to break that boy. Oh, he's a mess. Is proud the entire time she's saying those very words. 
Now mm-hmm. that in the clinical community, psychological, you know, that's odd behavior. Mm-hmm. I'm sorry, I'm 63 years old. Unpack, why are you denigrating your child? If you ask that mother 2021, 20, she probably doesn't even have an answer. I don't want him to get a big head or, you know, he's got it. No, 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 that's not it. Now, I rolled it back because I read thousands of slave narratives and interviewed someone whose grandmother told her this herself who had been enslaved. So I, mm. literally first person there. So mm. now let's roll it back to slavery 300 years. You have a black mother. Mm-hmm. Maybe she's working in the fields, child working nearby, white slave owner, male or female comes through, says to the black mother working in the fields, enslaved, that's your boy over there? Yep. That's my boy. That mm. boy sure is coming along, that boy. He's just, my goodness, he's really coming along. What is she going to say? No, he's not. He can't do anything. He's lazy. He's stupid. I don't want you to sell him. That's common sense. That's called appropriate adaptation. I denigrate him to protect him. But because we've been told to get over it, let's not have this conversation. It's not relevant. I wasn't there. We passed it along through generations, normalized it, and called it cultural. And what Mm. that is, is adaptive. And Mm. it made sense then. But now let's Mm. roll it back to 2021. Black Mm. mother seated in the the environment. Her son is looking at her and going, why can't you be proud of me? How come you can't be proud of me? Because he doesn't know the secret yet. And by Mm. the time he learns it, he's already been injured by it. Mm. Post-traumatic slave syndrome. Does everyone do that? No. But a significant number of us have normalized it and called it cultural. And that's poison in the cookies. That's not cultural. And so it's not, you see what I'm saying? It's not, someone would love to make it something simple that does not require justice. All of this requires social justice and it requires a, a, a real deep look at what colonialization has done. A deep look at what uh, what it means to heal. What it, what does reparations mean? You know, all of those things we have to have a conversation about, but we can't do it unless we know it. And again, we don't have this information in front of us. That's why I wrote the book. I didn't make it up. It wasn't provocative. It was history. I mean, it really wasn't. All I did was describe what they left out of my textbooks. It's not that they didn't know. They just didn't put it there. Hence, they don't want critical race theory. They don't want the truth. Uh, that's right. That's right. And we really appreciate you uh, adding to the body of knowledge because even us from this part of the world, we can relate, you know, and we don't need to learn from memes. We need real books that really <laughs> uh, get us thinking. So uh, at Before Slavery, what we're trying to do is bring uh, scholars as they are a reliable source of information, uh, as you know, African and Black history in general has been underrepresented, underrecorded. We can barely find historical records of how our ancient past was. So before slavery, we were trying to bring all, all that body of knowledge in a central place and, and begin to tell a story, a positive story of how black people were in the ancient past. But we would like to hear from a clinical standpoint, how does the knowledge of ancient history help with the healing of communities and individuals? Um, But everything we know about healing, everything we know suggests that when you go to the doctor, anyone here, if you go to the doctor, and I don't care what you go for, it doesn't even matter what you go for, right after they hand you that insurance form, the second thing they're gonna ask you is your history, yes? They're going to ask you not just your history. They're going to ask you your mama's history, your father's history, however many people you know in your family that have had a particular illness in order to impact you in that moment. So history has always been essential part of understanding how to move forward, whether we're talking about mental health, physical health, generally speaking, well-being. We need history. So that's not new either right but it's but when people start looking at um and what i've learned to do in my research in my work is to always look at the research look at where the science is teaching us what the science is teaching us so the science is teaching us now i wrote post-traumatic literally i mean i've revised the book but i wrote it in 2005 it's an old book but the knowledge is really new for so many people now yes. as a result of my book though Now, remember, when I wrote the book back then, I certainly wasn't educated in epigenetics. Now I am. And based on epigenetics, what they did was they took a, this is also not new, but they took a group of uh, animals, some mice, 
and they accustomed the mice to develop an aversion to a smell. So they would release like the smell of rose or peppermint. And then what they do is they shock the mice. So the mice would then, of course, uh, associate the shock with the smell. And after a while, you have, you know, you have this reinforcement. But then after a while, they don't even need to shock the mice. All they have to do is release the smell and the mice freak out. Well, then they tested the babies of those mice. And their babies were born with an aversion to peppermint, having never been exposed to peppermint. And then they tested the grandbabies of those mice. And those babies were born with an aversion to peppermint, having never been exposed to it. And then they began to realize that trauma becomes associated with the gene expression. So we're talking about it showing up as markers on the DNA. So now let's unpack that. We can talk about a, a, a big flood, an earthquake, all kinds of stuff, and generations of people that have been impacted by that. What do you think 300 years of trauma did? First of all, we've got physical evidence that it shows up, which maybe built some extraordinary resilience, right? We know because we've survived all of this. But we, don't right. tell me that that doesn't match or matter here when we know biologically it matters. Now, let's take a look at it from a sociological vantage point. And I think, um, it, matter of fact, I want to share, share my screen so I could actually share. But I wanted to read this because I thought I use it as an opening for my courses and for my, my talks. I call it this house. This is taken from CAST, The Origins of Our Discontent by Isabel Wilkerson. For those people... Uh, especially people in America that have that statement. What, is that, what does that past have to do with me? We in the developed world are like homeowners who inherited mm -hmm. a house on a piece of land that is beautiful on the outside, but whose soil is unstable loam and rock, heaving and contracting over generations, cracks patched, but the deeper ruptures waved away for decades, centuries even. Many people may rightly say, I had nothing to do with how this all started. I have nothing to do with the sins of the past. My ancestors never attacked indigenous people, never owned slaves. And yes, not one of us was here when this house was built. Our immediate ancestors may have had nothing to do with it, but here we are, the current occupants of a property with stress cracks and bold walls and fissures built into the foundation. We are the heirs to whatever is right or wrong with it. We did not erect the uneven pillars of Joyce, but they are ours to deal with now. And any further deterioration is, in fact, on our hands. Unaddressed, the ruptures and diagnosed cracks will not fix themselves. Toxins will not go away, but rather will spread, leach, and mutate as they already have. When people live in an old house, they come to adjust to the idiosyncrasies and outright danger skulking in an old structure. They put buckets under a wet ceiling, prop up groaning floors, learn to step over that rotting wood in the staircase. The awkward becomes, well, acceptable, and the unacceptable becomes merely inconvenient. Live with it long enough, and the unthinkable becomes normal. Exposed over the generations, we learn to believe that the incomprehensible is a way that life is supposed to be. And I love that statement from um, Isabel because it really speaks to something much broader. Those of us that feel like we want to disconnect from our history. Nobody disconnects from their history. And nobody is asked to disconnect from it more than people of African descent. And it's not because they don't want us to see us. They don't want the world to see them. So I'm, the last thing I want to share is something specifically about telling your story. Mm -hmm and why it is important. So I'm answering that question for you. Let me get that out of the way. There's all these things in the way, so let me get to the one. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I am not great at navigating this. This is taken from a New York Times article uh, that was, look, it's called um, uh, The Stories That Bind Us. Mm. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to get rid of my, this panel that's in the way. Okay. Sarah, a psychologist who works with children with learning disabilities, noticed something about her students. The ones who know a lot about their families tend to do better when they face challenges, she said. Her husband was intrigued and along with the colleague, Robin Fivish, set out to test her hypothesis. They developed a measure called the Do You Know Scale that asked children to answer 20 questions. Examples. Do you know where your grandparents grew up? Do you know where your mom and dad went to high school? 
Do you know where your parents met? Do you know an illness or something really terrible that happened in your family? Do you know the story of your birth? Dr. Mm -hmm. Duke and Dr. Fivish asked those questions of four dozen families in the summer of 2001 and take several of their dinner table conversations. They then compare the children's results to a battery of psychological tests that children had taken and reached an overwhelming conclusion. The more children knew about their family's history, the stronger their sense of control over their lives, the higher their self-esteem, and the more successfully they believe their families function. The Do You Know scale turned out to be the best single predictor of children's emotional health and happiness, and then something unexpected happened. Two months wow. later was 9-11. As citizens, Dr. Duke and Dr. Fivish were horrified like everyone else, but as psychologists, they knew they had been given a rare opportunity. Though the families they studied had not been directly affected affected by the events. Remember I talked about trauma? They were not directly affected by the events. All the children experienced the same national trauma at the same time. Researchers went back, reassessed the children. Once again, Dr. Duke said, the ones who knew more about their families proved to be more resilient, meaning they could moderate the effects of stress. Why does knowing where your grandmother went to school help a child overcome something as minor as a skinned knee or as major as a terrorist attack? The answers have to do with the child's sense of being part of a larger family, village. Dr. Duke said the children that have the most self-confidence have what he and Dr. Fivish call a strong intergenerational self. They know they belong to something bigger than themselves. So when we, when we begin to take a look at this, and you mentioned religion, we have to understand that 20% of the enslaved Africans, especially those who are coming to the Americas, were Muslim. So again, we also have kind of this you know, kind of a, a flat picture of even spiritual traditions and folks that weren't Muslim or Christian, right? And so when we start looking at uh, this whole idea of why history is important, not only does it inform us, but it heals us. It's not that my family had it great. It's the fact that my family had this oscillating ups and downs. We had good times, we had bad times, but here we still are. And how remarkably important that is 2021 for children. So when people start making those statements, I don't need to know that, that's ignorance. Because we do need to know it. We need to know it back then, we need to know it right now, and we need to know it in terms of our future. That's right. Yeah, that's key. And that's a major part of why there is a Before Slavery Museum project going on. So that people have a way of connecting Absolutely. We have a way of knowing that we belong to something larger than ourselves. And I, uh, and uh, <coughs> piggybacking on what you said earlier about, um, you know, denigrating the, the child that you're proud of. Um, I remember, um, and, and it's, it's not the same concept, but similar. Uh, I remember, uh, going to my dad and saying, Dad, did you know that you know, if we follow our our family back far enough, it'll reach all the way back to Israel. Like, and I thought I was shocking him. And I thought he would, you know, eyes would, you know, would pop in. But he was very, he very calmly said to me, oh, we, we always knew that. We, if you look at a map, you'll see, you know, the area that the people of the Bible have written about and they had to be people of color, number one. And then he said, even the New Testament tells us that he who is last will be first. Mm. <laughs> and he who is first will be last. He said, all those things gave us clues. And I was thinking to myself, well, why didn't you pass that down? You know, why didn't you share that? And, and it goes back to what you said, because if you run, run around out there sharing that kind of thing openly, you put yourself... Yeah, you do. <laughs> you're proud. And your religion that has been taught to you since you were young tells you to not be proud. Mm, you I'll, know, I'll so, who you are, where you listen, came from. I, 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 rarely, yes. I rarely jump into biblical, but if you go to Numbers 12... <laughs> Mm -hmm. <laughs> it says, and Miriam 
And Aaron spake against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman whom he had married, for he had married an Ethiopian woman. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against him, and the cloud departed from off the tabernacle. And behold, Miriam became white as snow. She became leprous. So when we unpack that story, and I talk to my Jewish brothers and sisters who could very well be brothers and sisters, understand <laughs> God got mad, smiting Miriam with leprosy because she didn't like Moses's black wife. How often have you had that conversation? Mm. Right. It's not and like it's obscure. Me. It's not like it's obscure. It's and, and again, you got to remember that the, the, the Ethiopian Jews, they, they try to keep them out of Israel until they realize that their DNA predates theirs. Right. So, so again, when people know better, they can do better. But what we cannot right. do is shrink from trying to understand. And right. as much as we can understand, for not not so we can wallow in angry anger or you know blame people. That's not what this is about. This is about right. changing the trajectory of the future mm -hmm. for all people. That's right. And but you are going to get there if you don't do right by Black people. If you don't do right by Indigenous people, we're not going to get there. And that, and again, folks would like to sit. I, you know, I have issues with the land acknowledgement. I, I understand that. So you're going to acknowledge that you took the land, right? It's an empty, an empty ceremony because that's more insulting to me than anything else. Oh yeah, let's acknowledge we stole your land and killed you. Okay, let's go on with our meeting now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, uh, so so again, I just have issues with the fact that we have that empty kind of ceremonial. Folks taking down statues and such. You know, that's all ceremonial. That's all symbolic. But in reality, if we're going to change the trajectory, we need to change these systems. And some of them can't be changed. They need to be torn down and, and built into something else. But whatever the case is, what we cannot continue to do is suggest that we're not going to deal with the past because the past is, is in the present. It's why we're in the present. And so, you know, again, uh, all of this information, it's not, you can look at it religiously, you can look at that ec ecologically, economically, spiritually, I don't care how you look at it. You know, we we see where we are and un you can't unsee it. We can't right. unknow what we know now. And post-traumatic is about knowing, doing, and improving. And mm -hmm. so we, we cannot improve if we don't know what's going on. You know, how come I got to talk about that? I can help you. You want me to tell you? I'm going to give you some reasons. <laughs> you can leave my class not knowing. Not going to happen. That's true. I'm just saying. <laughs> You're on. That's right. We're all, we all black at the end of the day. At the so end of the day, Even though I you're trying not to be. <laughs> That's right. And so, so I'm really curious because we have seen ever since but this couple of years, a lot of African Americans and uh, people of African descent from all over the world have started looking into Africa, ignoring all the negative news and reinvesting into Africa. Some of them are even repatriating to Africa. So in your experience, what really happened in Africa whilst you were there? And what did you observe that you related to in spite of having been born and raised from across the pond um, that you really related to that made you feel that connection so deeply and that inspired you and be open to that oneness. I think the first thing that I noticed, the very first thing was normalcy around blackness. <laughs> you know, it was, the, I was looking around me and everybody was black and nobody <laughs> seemed to have a problem with that. You know what I mean? I mean, <laughs> blackness, and again, I went into p villages that were quite poor, very, very poor villages, you know, that were mm -hmm. struggling, they were trying to get, you know, schools going, materials, everything you can imagine, food issues, but they weren't confused about being black. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Their issue is mm -hmm. my blackness. Fundamental. Mm -hmm. When I look in a the mirror, they're not going, oh, wow, I'm black. Nobody's tripping on being black. That was the first <laughs> thing I noticed. The normalcy. Of blackness, which felt so soothing to me. It felt so comforting to look around. It was the first time I saw black people on money. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> All the people on the money were black. I mean, you know, there were things, there were things about uh, the normalcy, the health, the history, the culture, the pride in blackness. That was the mm -hmm. first thing that I noticed. 
-hmm. And, you know, one of the things that I tell people, African-Americans in particular, there is something, and this is what really kind of started a long time ago. Anybody black that's, that's on here, and sometimes I'll run into a black person that's maybe a little confused, but usually I don't have an issue. Black people that don't know perfect strangers will go, right? I'm in right. a store. Yes. It's the nod. Right. That's right. You know what I'm saying? And what, and, and again, as, 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 as a social scientist, my, you know, mm -hmm. I'm looking at that behavior and what I always ask black people to do and anyone that's paying attention today, I want you to not, I don't want you to overthink that. I want you to tell me what you feel when someone walks down the street in the grocery store at the gas station, wherever they are, and they just go, <laughs> you know, what does it feel like? And for some reason, I, it just makes my day. I'm like, it just lifts you. It gives you this of being seen, of being having purpose, of having value, to be noticed. To be connected. So my, my black people are doing this. And every, anytime I see somebody, it's just a warm that shows up. Now I want it's, you it's, to take it's a look. That at Ubuntu. Ubuntu. It's that Ubuntu. Ubuntu. Yes. Yes. You mean that uh, mutual respect that, okay, I'm not having a conversation with you, but because I respect you, and even if I don't know your name and you're walking down the street, I respect you. So I'm going to greet you, even if I don't know you. That's, That's right. inherent in African culture. You That's greet right. everybody you see, you don't <laughs> ignore anybody. That's right. That's right. The opposite is true. African Americans, what, what I've tried to do with post traumatic is also bridge the gap. I'm saying mm -hmm. we're not that different. We're not that separate because when I got to, to uh, South Africa and I went to Umfravacht, which is um, uh, a community that where, where enslaved, the Dutch enslaved Africans. And in Umfravacht, mm -hmm. they didn't, they weren't connected to tribes. They only knew Afrikaans. They, they had some very typical, it reminded you of going back in time in, in, a, in the antebellum South here, here in the States. That's what it felt like in Umfravacht. Mm -hmm. They didn't have, they didn't know their tribal languages. They really didn't have a sense of their history. So the Dutch left it with hopes that the people would just die, literally. Mm -hmm. And what I learned about Umfravacht that helped me again hone this connection was I'm looking at an increase in domestic violence, drug and alcohol abuse, all of the similar problems that I saw in different parts of the world with people of African descent who had lost that connection, who had lost the connection with the culture because they didn't even know their tribal languages even though they were in Africa. But mm -hmm. there was a gentleman who went back, learned all the tribal languages he was from Overbox, went back, they built a well, they did, he did this incredible, they called him the bringer of milk because he came to restore his community. But what I learned about being in Ufravat, what I learned uh, how similar it was to what happened um, in, in Africa, I mean, in America, was, was something that, that started to transpire no matter where I went. When people mm -hmm. would greet, just like you said, everybody greeted everybody, first of all, all the time. Uh, and no matter how big the meeting was, everybody was going to greet <laughs> But in addition to that came a phrase that was in different, in different dialects and in different tribal languages. And it, the, the, what, it, what, what it would translate into in the United States would say, hey, what's up? What's up? It translated mm -hmm. into, I see you. Stay mm -hmm. with me. That's what it translated in. Hey, I see you. And is not that the same thing? Mm -hmm. If nobody sees you, sister, I see you today. I see mm -hmm. you. And that is exactly what Africans say. Maybe we didn't have we didn't have the, the protections to be able to, to say it out loud, so we just nodded. But we mm -hmm. were saying to each other throughout this time, I see you. No matter how much the world tries to erase you, no matter how insignificant they try to make you, no matter what they do, I see you. And it's mm -hmm. important because we are the pupil of the eye. And that comes from scripture. The black man is like the pupil of the eye. Every pupil and every eye is black. He said, but it is surrounded by a sea of white, but it is the pupil that contains the sight. It beholds what is before it. That's who we are. And we've never forgotten it. Our children have the ability to read people when they're children, they get in trouble in school because they can read their teacher's behavior. Don't mm -hmm. so tell me because I can read what you're not what you're saying, but I can read what's behind what you're saying at four. Mm -hmm. We can mm -hmm. do that at four. That's before the developmental charts say we can. 
but that's African. That's that's power and that's powerful. So we are we are behind time and we have to skip a lot of questions. But I'm sure our audience, please uh, follow Dr. Joy DeGroy. We're going to uh, share more information so you can follow her on her YouTube so you can hear more of her teachings. But just uh, two more questions, really. Um, I was really interested about you speaking about. Uh, people of African descent being the pupil of the eye. And we are connecting history and destiny, the future of where the black race is going, given the trajectory where we are in. We are in the era of eye opening. We are, we are going through the phenomenon where people are beginning to wake up. So um, how can people of African descent tap into this power, this inherent power, and bring change to the world? And what does the recognition of the PTSS help with that? Okay, so first of all, everybody, no matter where you are, no matter who you are, no matter what you do, you have a lane. <laughs> Everybody's in a lane. I don't tell people to get out their lane. Stay in your lane, but do the work in your lane. Everybody has work to do, to uplift, to educate, to heal ourselves, Whatever level that you can work at, uplifting is the key. And I think what post-traumatic tells us is it tells us of the strong shoulders we're standing on. It tells us that this too shall pass because nobody's going to tell, tell me that we can't make it and do some great things now and into the future, given what we did with no help, right. given what we did with a, neck, a knee on the neck for 300 years. We, we were able to advance ourselves here. We can't stop now. And we certainly can't stop by allowing our children to be ignorant about who paid for them mm -hmm. to be here. You cannot respect who you are. You cannot appreciate what's been done if you don't understand the shoulders you're standing on. And this, and our history books don't teach black children the, the, the shoulders they're, they're standing on, except during Be Kind to, to Negroes Month. And we may be hearing about it, I have a dream. And that's about it, right? It. We need to, first of all, don't expect people to educate. We, we, look how many years we are in. 20 400, hours. 400 years in. And we, we, we still don't have it. They try to take what was in the textbook out. Mm -hmm. They're trying to eliminate even the minuscule two pages of Black history out now. So why do we think that the very folks that don't want this to, are going to reinvest in us knowing it? Mm -hmm. We have to invest in us knowing it. That's why I wrote the book. I wrote the book because I said, well, maybe if nobody reads any book, they're going to get some significant history out of this book. And they're mm -hmm. going to talk about a lot of contributors and those whose shoulders we're standing on. Mm -hmm. And then we have to be the shoulders, right? We, this generation, have to be the shoulders mm -hmm. that our young people stand on. And again, folks, I'm already, I mean, I've had mentored a lot of folks in the, in the academy, in the academic academy, that are taking the work so much further, that are doing so much more, so much better, of course. But I'm here to be that shoulder. Does that make sense? That we all have to be that shoulder. And we also have to expect, teach, educate yourself. Don't expect them to do it. Mm -hmm. You know, for what they want, no. So again, we the way we do it, post-traumatic helped to inform. It awakened things. It made people curious. It made people question. It made people get introspective. It made people say, no, I can do more and better. That's what That's we want to encourage. That's right. That's right. Thank you so much, Dr. Jagru. We couldn't get all the get through all the questions, but our audience, um, we are going to send more information. Uh, please take your time to read the book. Thank you so much, Dr. Jagru. It's an honor having you. Um, so I'm going to head back to Miss Pat. Miss Pat. Yes. Okay. Thank you so much. It has been a pleasure. I, I would love to continue on um, and maybe we can do this again um, another time and take on where we left off. But uh, right now I want to make sure that everyone knows uh, Dr. DeGruy's book is called Post Traumatic Slave Syndrome. You can find it on her website 
uh, which is joydegru.com. You can also find it on Amazon and many other places. Please be sure to get to get the book. Uh, also, uh, our last two webinars, we did the survey drawings and we did not give out the gifts. So the winners are Kaitha Clark and Serena Trigg. I'm going to share my screen. You have the ability to choose either uh, Ruby's Africa, which is um, children's stories through video. If you don't have children, you can choose the t-shirt, Before Slavery t-shirt, and we'll be sending you an email. Uh, just some really quick housekeeping here. I want everyone to know we have uh, another a webinar coming up in a couple of weeks. And um, our Jerusalem challenge will be coming up very soon. A special thanks to our sponsor, WPGN Radio and WONI Radio, um, who are sponsoring the Jerusalem challenge. And it will be broadcast in 180 markets across the world. So we thank you, Dr. Joy, for coming. It has been a definite pleasure. And we, um, we're not able to open the, the floor to questions right now, but um, we will share information on where you can find her book. Okay, I see it's been posted there for Amazon. It's also on her website, uh, joydegru.com. So please answer the survey at the end of this webinar and you will be entered into the next drawing. Uh, let's see. So much. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So uh, for all those who are attending, please uh, answer the survey to help us uh, in improving the webinar and help us understand what you enjoy listening to so that we can get to un uh, invite guests who can be assistance to you as in to your knowledge needs. Um, and also, please just look out for the emails and we have our radio show, which is premiering on August 1st on Warney Radio. Please uh, just tune in, listen, and uh, definitely you enjoy. We are, we are bringing you more content, and all this is just building up to opening up before slavery. So thank you so much for joining us. We hope to see you again in our next webinar. Make sure to also follow us on our Facebook, our Instagram, and our Twitter. It's all before slavery. Who, uh, who are we exhibit? Thank you. Blessings. Bye-bye. Until next time.